call to the call center through mobile app through website almost 35000 active users of department are connected to this uh, sampark portal once you file a grievance this is automatically allocated to the concerned node officer of the concerned department from where uh, the grievance is uh, disposed of kisan sampark portal is again a uh, single window platform for farmers for availing the subsidies for uh, all these uh, agriculture department horticulture marketing board and even the secretary all are connected to this rajasthan kisan sathi portal so this is again a single uh, this is again a big uh, portal which is being used by the farmers for subsidies and uh, reimbursements common platform includes rajasthan e sign again uh, electronics uh, 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 electronic signing uh, project rajasthan has been declared as a certified authority in 2019 and now we are Signing almost 20,000 documents daily, and uh, around 1 crore 20 lakh documents have been e-signed during 2021 and 22. And during current year, it has been 1 crore 35 lakhs. So that is the volume that e-sign is uh, doing. And e-sanjar is a SMS uh, platform from where all applications are delivering SMSs to the beneficiary or to the residents. So last year the messages sent were around 40 crores, and in 2022 it is around till October it is 60 crores. Application in at various stages are sending SMS messages to the uh, applicants. So this is through this e-sanjar portal. Then we have got a single sign-on portal again. This is unique in the country. This uh, only Rajasthan state has, has been uh, uh, the pioneer in establishing this uh, portal. There are around 248 G2G and 159 G2C application which are behind single sign-on. These application you don't need to remember different password for entering different portals of government department. There is just one uh, single portal, single sign-on, from where you can sign in and enter into all these applications. Around 400 plus applications are there, and almost 2 crore 49 lakh SSO IDs have been created on this portal. Then there is a e vault, uh, which is a repository of documents, and again 40 crore plus documents have been stored under in this. This is like a digit digi locker of government of India. Rajdhara is a GIS uh, portal which uh, takes care about uh, all geographical information system uh, related uh, issues, and Raj Master is again a common master, a common master data hub. Which is being utilized across all government uh, applications, and there are around around 150 masters which uh, which are there in this uh, uh, platform, and, and more than 30 app, uh, 30 departments are using it. Uh, basically, district master, village master, uh, all those kind of masters, and with a common core, which so that easy integration can be done across applications. Seva Dwar is an electronic service bus where more than 1100 uh, plus services have been integrated, and as is available, there are more than 550 crore transaction that has been done using ESP. This is basically used for integrating two applications. So there are 40 applications which have been integrated using Raj Seva Dwar. Then Rajpath uh, is basically a e-office uh, platform, and one of the important uh, module of this uh, application has been the e-file system. As uh, the uh, previous speaker uh, in the inaugural session had mentioned about this, now all files are electronically maintained on computers. You, uh, no physical file movement uh, will be done in government office. So that is through this uh, portal. Your leave management, your annual appraisal, your immovable property return, everything is on. Uh, this is a basically a portal uh, for increasing efficiency of government working. Then there is a RTI portal for uh, residents, like they can file their RTI application uh, through this portal. 
uh, almost 275 departments have been onboarded on this portal and uh, RTI application that have been filed till now is around 1,57,000 uh, and dispose, disposal is around 1,20,000 1, RTI appeals have also been filed on this portal, 23,300 Raj ERP is similar to Raj Cards Raj Cards is for government offices and Raj ERP package is basically for all PSUs Public sector undertaking, JVD and RSMM are all using this JMRC. Uh, these uh, PSUs are using Raj ERP. Capacity building, uh, I will not be taking it up. Mr. Uh, Mr. Jyoti would uh, define this capacity building. Raj Nam Knowledge Corporation Limited, Rajiv Gandhi Center of Advanced Technology, Rajiv Gandhi FinTech Digital Institute, and Riyal. And your knowledge innovation hubs. This is uh, the and ISAR. Man, we will be taking up ISAR also. Uh, ISAR is uh, will also be taken up by this is Shruti. This is the complete ecosystem that uh, government of ISAR has built. Other than this, there are uh, I think 400 plus websites that are hosted in our data center and various other application sector specific applications which have been developed and are working. Uh, that has been the contribution by, uh, and there are uh, applications which NIC has also developed like for transport department, Bahan application, for registration and step, for integrated financial management system. So then, uh, there are a number of contributions which NIC also has made for uh, uh, in the journey of digital Rajasthan. So this was the overview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anjali. Thank you so much for the insight with the single, uh, single sign-on. You know, so I have tried that once, but I've never felt the 200 plus areas you can do that. I mean, and in fact, uh, the e-sign was an eye-opener too as well. You know, the, in fact, I would like to ask you a question later on: the whether as a private sector can we also use an e-sign services from the government? Oh, that is very interesting because uh, that because of more conflicts with government. Uh, thank you so much for the insight. I now call upon uh, Ms. Shepra Bhala Chaudhary from uh, SAP India to speak on cloud for digital transformation. Good morning, Namaskar. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, Fiki to invite me back again here. I was just uh, uh, mentioning to Dibbul just before the session started that I remember uh, the last physical events that I attended here before the pandemic and uh, things have clearly the industry changed a lot personally changed a lot i was not wearing specs the last time i was here and clearly i can't go without at this point uh, but thank you for inviting me to this wonderful city um, and um, i want to run you through a few ideas on cloud and how uh, it has become the fulcrum or it is fueling transformation uh, across the industries uh, some of the points that i will be covering here are uh, you know why digital citizens, you and me, are a reality today, how the cloud transformation is actually taking off in the country, what are the tenants for it, how can cloud really transform your businesses, what is the India perspective to the cloud transformation, and uh, one of my personal passions uh, that SAP also, uh, thankfully endorses, is using sustainability, uh, uh, using technology for sustainability as a key driver in each and every transformation that you undertake, uh, uh, you know, at an organization level, at a government level, and at a country level. Uh, I'm sure that uh, everybody knows that today we are moving from digital to intelligent to an experience-driven economy. The last decade has, if anything, summarized our experiences through the digital era, moving to the intelligent era, and now into the experience era. Digital era uh, was where uh, you know digital optimization as a means of digital transformation was used because everybody saw cost benefits in that particular pillar. Uh, in the when we moved to the intelligent era, we realized that digital uh, digital optimization is no longer your goal or no longer just con considered transformation in silos. Newer businesses, newer business models have emerged uh, so much so that machines have become our co-workers, right? But today we realize that transformation itself has gone through transformation. Uh, everybody looks at operational data which is no longer sufficient 
for you to run any businesses. Experiential data is what is required, whether you are at an industry level or even when uh, government is speaking to its citizens. Experiential data is something that all citizens require. That enhances customer and citizen experience. Keeping that uh, particular tenet in mind, um, I, I want to dwell over how the cloud transformation is taking off. Uh, cloud changes, cloud has changed probably everything we know about business, about IT, about the way we work. It has changed how businesses run and how people work by creating newer ways to deliver technology and services and build new applications and delivery models. Cloud has necessarily created new engagement models that deliver exceptional experience, the experience that I was just talking about. In a world where companies and workforces have become more mobile, more social, everyone is on their phone, their tablets, you know, uh, and it is increasing by the hour and the minute. Cloud creates new ways for people to collaborate along a path that didn't exist up till now or could not have been imagined up till now. It delivers new insights uh, that empower all of us to explore, to innovate, to drive, uh, you know, positive changes across all businesses and industries. However, to get businesses, to allow a business to get value from cloud, you have to change not only technologies, but more than that, you have to change your culture, the organization, the people, and the processes. And mind you, I agree that that could be a challenge. What cloud does is solve for most choices. You know, thankfully, new cloud innovations that can create a personalized path to cloud and then also do it in ways that make genuine cloud transformation much more realistic versatile than ever before. Here is why I think that cloud can be fueling transformations. See, customers will demand choices when it comes to cloud. They want public cloud, they want private, they want hybrid, and they want the ability to manage all these workloads identically across these environments. There is no such thing as one size will fit all or, or there is n n nothing which is a cookie cutter approach when it comes to cloud. Some workloads will move lift and shift style to a cloud platform and infrastructure. In other cases, companies may want to uh, develop a test uh, in the cloud but move to an identical on-premises environment for production. Some companies want, might want the flexibility of paying for use cloud services managed by a cloud provider but with the physical hardware testing in their data center due to obvious regulatory concerns. So when it comes to cloud, choice and flexibility that will drive the adoption and the growth. When you look at how some companies approach cloud, it is not uncommon to see multiple app applications from multiple vendors all pieced together like a jigsaw, you know, in a way that it creates silos. And you wonder, you know, wait, wasn't cloud supposed to make things easier? Of course it was, and it can. But what's required is a fully integrated environment that spans all layers either uh, uh, from an infrastructure, uh, infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or software as a service and a suite of engineered systems designed for cloud that serve as the foundation for your infrastructure. We at SAP do believe that integrated cloud will unlock transformation across all industries as it removes barriers to innovation which all of us agree is the key to growth as of today. When technology can work together to provide real solutions when applications can be integrated and extended to meet our needs, when uh, we can use information from different sources that can be unified for real insights, when all of us, all the people can work seamlessly, we can securely access applications and information from any location, from any device. Then we can truly unite traditional premise solutions and the cloud and then we become much greater than simply connecting the various pieces. That is why I think that cloud is actually equal to more than the sum of its all its parts. Of course, today, security remains the reason for many companies to avoid using cloud services, right? Aggressive cloud adopters, however, beg to differ. And they have, uh, they say that security can go from being a detriment to cloud adoption to actually being an enabler. That's because cloud providers today have much greater expertise and resources to keep up with the ever-changing threat landscape. The average organization, for example, that doesn't have the capability to build data security for cloud services at an application level, we agree, but also in the database and even at the microprocessor level. IT leaders will 
never surrender their information security strategy and ideally they shouldn't. However, day-to-day -day execution of information uh, security will be increasingly left to cloud providers. It is, it is no secret that everybody agrees that cloud accelerates innovation and growth. It fuels that cloud. Perhaps some companies have an on-premise application that they haven't upgraded in two to three years, you know. Or maybe they stopped upgrading it at all. Their finance, their HR, their supply chain, uh, their legal, you know, uh, or, 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 or their purchase and invoicing may have their apps to still get the job done or the work done. But should they be just satisfied in checking the box for these essential resources? Moving to cloud platforms uh, speeds innovation in many, many ways. With cloud, companies can implement new cloud applications in a matter of months and not years, right? With multiple times a year, teams are always using the latest versions of the software rather than continually falling behind the state of art. Instead of sp spending time patching software and servers to run outdated apps, IT teams, even smaller IT teams can now spend time helping HR, finance, you know, and other teams make the best use of new features, data, and analysis. That is exactly how innovation takes root in an organization and becomes part of a culture. I believe that the success in cloud will come from the ability of each company to forge its unique path because in truth there is no single map or single road to cloud. Our mission as providers is to help customers discover their path regardless of where they are today. Ultimately, an integrated solution must span both on-premise and cloud because applications and information live in both and potentially will coexist for many, many years to come. Customers do need the flexibility to move seamlessly between both three environments. Let me bring you to why cloud is uh, essential to India's story. You know, India is now often seen as growing into the hub for cloud solutions. Our digital landscape is changing even as I speak. You know, we have more than 800 million internet users, 1.2 billion telecom service consumers, which is probably one of the highest in the world. Technology has quickly and radically changed nearly every sector of Indian economy, including government service delivery. Data consumption generated by over half a billion digital users today is growing exponentially, right? And it will be fluid by the rollout of 5G in more cities than what it's available right now. Usage of IoT services, data localization, making way for India to become a major hub for data center and cloud technology. This has all been further uh, pushed or catalyzed by the pandemic, right? The ongoing wave of di di digital transformation across industries represents so many opportunities and potential for India that can play a key role for the country's vision of a trillion dollar economy in a few years. While achieving its growth, it is imperative and extremely critical that we think about the environment as well. Sustainable development today is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Just a few years ago, sustainability was not even a boardroom topic, you know. Today, CEOs are making it a strategic priority. Their shareholders demand them to. The investors now integrate ESG reporting into invest investment decision. Consumers are making, consumers like you and me, are making clear shifts to more sustainable products and services. And even employees are making career choices based on their employees' responsibility towards the planet. It is our responsibility individually and collectively to work towards sustainability, both as an example and an exemplar. When I say example, I mean that can you work with your IT department or your supply chain department to make uh, your organization as green as possible, green IT, power usage, energy usage, uh, water consumption, all of that. And when I talk about exemplar, uh, in case of SAP, the organization that I represent, we, we are developing solutions using technology for sustainability that we can embed for our customers, making their processes and their organizations uh, more sustainable, more green, more efficient. Underscoring our commitments to India's growth and to advance the vision of uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat, SAP is leveraging an agile and scalable cloud technology that is for developed in India and now made available in local data centers to help Indian enterprises recalibrate their businesses to run better sustainability. In, to tap into this growth, I believe we need to think forward. 
and start working towards building and amplifying homegrown talent for management of data centers and cloud infrastructure. This is how, my friends, I believe we can truly leverage the cloud for transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shipra. Thank you so much. Very insightful in terms of how the cloud is uh, the key for innovation. And a lot of um, a couple of more questions I ask you after the other speakers. So let me now invite uh, Ms. Jyoti Rohania, technical director of DOIT, speaking on nurturing youth for Industry 4.0. Can you uh, advise me about and uh, share uh, the my passionate topic of capacity building with the students here. I am really delighted to share news about youth, students, education, talent, technology and talent transformation. Uh, I would not like to take, uh, speak much about it, but I will just take a short journey. As everyone knows, there is industrial revolution and we are talking about 4.0 and our movement towards 5.0. So what is Industrial Revolution 1.0? Everyone is aware. After the Mechanical when we are working manually, we have Industry 1.0 with the advent of using the power of water and steam, then which was replaced by Industrial Revolution 2.0, which was the use of electricity and the assembly lines. We have, the, uh, we have our Industrial Revolution 3.0, which led to the automation of by computers and uh, chips. Then we have Industrial Revolution 4.0, which is a digitization, which is automation plus data, which which we are in the present times. And we have also have a set output on the Industrial Revolution 5.0. So uh, let's talk about this. With a change of time, these skills, the environment. The need of the industry keeps changing and evolving. I do remember when people were talking about keep, you talk about any skills, branch, technology, and when you talk about IT, IT is the field where we have seen the fastest pace of improvement changes. I remember in our times we used to have just core subjects. Uh, we used to have civil, we used to have electrical, we used to have mechanical, and then we have started having communication. Later on, till last 10 years also, when you talk about any engineering subjects or any admissions or any academies, they used to divide between core and IT. Core method, it has, has to be core, which is infrastructure, it has to be civil, it has to be mechanical, it has to be electrical, and IT is separate. But now, what is the status to today? IT is the main, IT is the main industry, and the others are going into its domain. I think everyone will agree to it. We have, we do not, we talk about education, but now we talk about edu tech. So we have a word tech behind. We talk about agriculture, we have tech, we have edu tech, we have medical, med tech, we have climate tech, we have uh, regulations also, we have regulate tech. So we have technology behind. So now IT is the main industry and others are, are becoming the domain. If you talk about banking, we, how do we remember? We talk about going to the banks, uh, having an interaction with people, taking out money, currency. Now, what is the status today? Or we have like, we've talked about digital transactions. We don't need to go to the bank, interact with the people. So, how has the banking industry also changed? This also become totally IT. And people are talking about the currencies also. You have your uh, cryptocurrencies also. So, you can see how IT has not only become an Enabler, it has been embedded. So, nevertheless, the skills required for the youth and the students has also changed. It is not necessary that earlier when we should talk, we should talk about only uh, students should have an aptitude to use computers, to re, uh, to have uh, a raw programming language, and work forward with it. But today, what it is, we have a huge set of data. So, what we require the skills is not just programming or the wrong or the learning. It has changed. What we require now is thinking. We need critical thinking. We need uh, analysis of the data, analytical thinking. We require a lot of other parts uh, uh, which has totally changed the entire uh, set of our uh, uh, skill set required. Nevertheless, because of the difference in change in the skill set, the areas have also increased. 
you can see now you, we could used to have different only limited streams in engineering. Now we have n number of side streams being coming. You have cyber security, you have nanotechnology, you have uh, AI, you have machine language. Now we have other things like uh, we are talking about deep learning. Today, like right, uh, in the other session, uh, so was saying that now it is a time where we work. We have lot of we have lot of uh, facilities. We uh, are not like okay, why? That is all because of IT. We are using AI. We are making use of machine language. A simple thing you can talk. Let us we are talking about driverless bullet trains. That is giving vision to the drivers. We talk about virtual assistants. We talk about uh, we talk about Alexa. We talk about cars. We will just by uh, saying you will be able to operate the cars. So these all require a different skill set for all together from uh, the big earlier ones. As uh, earlier speaker, I now I would like to focus on what Rajasthan, what is the status, what has Rajasthan given us. As uh, Ali Singh Ji had said, ki when we talk about Rajasthan, Rajasthan has created a lot of infrastructure and uh, I think all will agree here, the uh, people coming from other states and other governments also. Whenever word Rajasthan is heard in the, at, at the national forum, everyone has a smile and yes, it has a regard to Rajasthan as a front runner. Infrastructure key details, you have seen that we have been front runner in creating all the infrastructure details, uh, infrastructure position here. We have done lot of tasks in the software applications. We have been pioneer in introducing lot of applications, be it single sign-on or be it, uh, uh, we talk about uh, Janaha, which is being followed uh, by and replicated by different states and uh, different states as well as at the national level. Then why? In the last 7 years, 10 years, Rajasthan has done much. Even then, at the back of the mind, different people have Bangalore, Karnataka, Hyderabad. Why? So now it's time for us, since government is, has a vision to position Rajasthan at the top, it is creating in, uh, infrastructure, it is investing, it is giving a lot of incentives in the form of policies, uh, uh, a very uh, uh, lucrative and user friendly policy of IT policies, of the industry policy, startup policy. So now we should work to get to position and make Rajasthan a space where people call the Bangalore and Rajasthan is uh, almost at the same. What, where, what is the difference between Bangalore and Rajasthan? Like someone was talking to me and was saying, what is the geographical factors which we cannot address? Right? So let us talk about the other factors. Why cannot? Then the second comes the skill sets. So presently, Rajasthan has taken a lot of initiatives and it is uh, the pioneer initiatives across the country which I think is the first which has been taken up by Rajasthan. So in that line, I would like to uh, start up. Rajasthan, uh, when we talk about students, youth, earlier when, we, when any initiative is taken, it has been taken in silos. You target one specific segment and you start working on it. What happens is when you work with one a particular segment, the other segment falters. So now, Rajasthan is envisioning an entire ecosystem of initiatives to ensure that the students, the youth are skilled, they have the opportunity to skill, to reskill and also to make them employable. So to start, we have first, uh, I like uh, uh, the, our former Prime Minister of stresses on Make in India. So we should not only be for taking jobs, we should be in a position to create jobs. So we have your startup program and everyone is aware, I start of Rajasthan is one of the flagship program and it is one of the best in the country. I start, we have our, uh, the main uh, hub which is the Techno Hub here at Jaipur but its branches spreading across the state. As I have said, Presently, Rajasthan is working to create an entire ecosystem. So it is not that we create any infrastructure only at Jaipur and then we try to see the effect of it. So we are trying to go across the state, across the entire state. So we are having our eight spokes also of the ISAT, which are the ISAT list, which are there at uh, Bikaner, Jodhpur, Pali, Churu, Ajmer, Kota and Udaipur. 
And also, you can, we, uh, I'm delighted to share that we have more than 150 plus startups already housed in the buildings with 3,000 startups already registered. So that is a very big number which has like uh, houses. And, to, uh, uh, and we have a very uh, lucrative and good startup policy which has been in, uh, introduced here, which is the startup policy 2022 in which a lot of uh, incentives have been given where the startups, the sustenance allowance or the preceding uh, stage, the grants have been increased. So the grants of around 2.40 lakhs are being given and for women it is around 3 lakhs. Even after the seeding stage, viability to the startups is about to around 60 lakhs. So any student, any youth with some innovative idea things, he, he may try to nurture it. So government is there to support, to mentor, to incubate, so that that idea has it flourishes and the, and it, uh, and the, uh, and they are able to create jobs and becomes a very good entrepreneur. We are having uh, the through the IT policy, uh, through the startup policy, scale up funds to the tune of two crores can be given. Can be given. And similarly, these are just the incentives. After that, to see that the startups also have business. Whenever they talk for any investment or equity or fundraising, business kya hai? How much have you done? So for that, government of Rajasthan has given amendments in the procurement rules so that these startups can be given orders up to 15 lakhs. Not only single, you can give number of orders as per the today. And even you can give orders to the tune of 2 crores to the startups. So if such policies, such amendments are there in the procurement act, so then the student, the, the startups can, they have a chance to flourish. Apart from that, when I am talking about uh, startups, if we can see that students, every time across the world, you know, the students, uh, Indian students have bright minds. So, not we do not wait the, uh, till the students come, complete the graduation, and then start to make a startup. So, the Rasa Nabi has already started the school startup. Any student in the school has an innovative idea, so they can work upon it. You have mentors who can. Uh, help them out so that they can work on the ideas. So it is going to be one level above the science projects what we call. Science projects where the student used to work but what is the school startup? It is one le level above the science projects where the student uh, can be hold by a mentor, by a teacher and help them out so that they can have a good product. Secondly, we can say rural startup. In the urban area, you might have a lot of issues and you have a lot of solutions for it. A lot of problems are being faced in the rural. And rural uh, also require solutions. And everyone is aware of the word, what we call in Indian language, Jugaad. Right? What does it there is any problem. So then the uh, people in the village with their uh, whatever technical skills they have, they create some uh, solution for it in the name of Jugaad. That is a rural startup. That how to scale up that? The same problem could be faced by others, other people also. So the same solution can be scaled up. Like so, someone was saying, Ki China kya karta hai? Keep on minting a number of products and mass production and it is there. Everywhere you find Chinese products. So this is where rural where you have problems, solutions are there in the minds of Indians and let us work for, uh, uh, help them out, sustain them, give them support so that they start working with them. Uh, uh, create a mass production for it. So we have a school startup, we have a rural startup, and then we have the startups which are being helped, fostered, incubated by the startup uh, iStart program. Secondly, what I was talking about is there is a gap. COVID has taught us that it is not necessary that students have to go to Bombay, Pune, or, uh, or globally to work in any company. Staying at home also they can work. So now, now it is right time that the skills of the students of Rajasthan is also upskilled and reskilled. So it the skills have to be made available to these students, easily accessible to the students. So we have government of Rajasthan has uh, announced like uh, uh, premier institutes, the best of the kind in, its, uh, in the country, to give uh, to help as a finishing school for the students. 
uh, and uh, so that they are they are readily employable and job ready. The first of the institute is Rajiv Gandhi Center for Advanced Technology, which is there at Jaipur. Uh, I would uh, take this uh, opportunity to please invite you all. Please come and visit the uh, uh, facility there, and you would be amazed. As like Rajasthan ka naam hai, Rajasthan is always does whatever does does in a big way. Uh, like so I was saying, we had the Bhavansha Techno Hub, one of its kind. The same facility when we visited US and all, we could not find matching facility there. Even yesterday, I could hear uh, a professor from US saying that uh, Amazon ke se jada achhi facility hai yaha Rajasthan mein. That was a, a remark of the professor who had come here. Amazon ki facility had been set up 10 years back. What we have done today is again a class of its kind. So we have our Rajiv Gandhi Center for Advanced Technology, where it is we it is vision to give global certification to the students. Normally, when students study from Rajasthan, when when they want to take job, they fall at two places. One, either they are not ready with the communication skills to uh, market themselves, to position themselves. Second, they are not having the skills as per the requirement of the industry today. So, to have to bridge both the gaps, we are going in a big way uh, with this uh, center where MOUs have been done with the technical giants directly. Like we have already done the MOU with uh, Oracle, we have done it with VMware, we have done it with Cisco. So we are having 8 OEMs here. We have done it with uh, Robotics, we have done it with Adobe, we have done it with SaaS and we have also done it with Linux. So these are the OEMs who are going to give the training through their trained persons, through their trained faculty here in the premises to the students and the students will get a global certification which will have value across the globe. So that is the facility. Now the students do not have to go to Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad to sit down there um, for 3 months, 6 months or sit on the bench first without any job, without any payment uh, to, to get the skills and then get a job in the industry. So this is the facility what we are having here at Arcad. And many more are to come, uh, already uh, Apple, uh, Intel, Microsoft, IBM are in the pipeline. So this is a facility where, where the students can get global certifications for the choice of their area and which is going to be equally valid. So sitting at their homes, they can get a global certification. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is so much in the Two minutes. Two minutes more. Then the second institute what we are talking about is the Rajasthan FinTech Digital Institute as Alan Singh just said. As we know Rajasthan has a lot of people in finance and banking uh, which is very innate to the genes. So we are having this facility uh, for uh, addressing the domain. Again, it's the first of the kind in the country, which is going to start in uh, Jodhpur. And Rajasthan Institute of Advanced Learning for Research and Innovation. Nevertheless, when, when I'm talking about that Rajasthan is creating an entire ecosystem, so we are having these learning centers, we are having center of excellence, as well as the innovation hubs. Innovation hubs, which uh, and I would like to stress here because time is running short. Okay, all these points what I am talking about, they are not on paper. They are already on flow. The institute, Arcad is already functioning. FinTech is already functioning. The ISTAP facilities are already there. And all the others, uh, the excellence hubs are already in place. So let us let all the people, the industry of Rajasthan, the academicians of Rajasthan and the government, let us work hand in hand so that uh, very soon the vision of Rajasthan being forefront is achieved very soon and uh, one of the names is when we call about the top most Rajasthan is there uh, with pride. Thank you. Thank you ma'am, thank you so much. Our next speaker today is Budhika Dhoka and she will be speaking on technology as a liver for future of events. Over to you Budhika. Good afternoon everyone. So we're talking about technology, but I'm missing the buzz in the room. Are we awake? Waiting for lunch? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. So I want to break the uh, monotony just a little bit. Uh, if uh, Ravi allows me, can sure, we have a conversation which is uh, much more open, much more interactive, uh, if that's possible? Uh, I will give you two scenarios. 
and then uh, we can take it forward from there. So take one, uh, we recently did a wedding where unfortunately uh, the bride's father passed away. At the day when she arrived at the altar, we had a holographic image of him sitting at the mandap. She bursted in out into tears, but I would just like you to think and analyze the technology that led to those emotions that changed her aspect of the most beautiful day of her life. Take two. Apan sab shadiyo mein gaye na? Yeah. Yeah. Vara ferry hoti hai. Barat mein dance karte hain. Dhol wale ke pas mein paytm number hai. Vara ferry mat karo. Paytm karo. So this is the transition that we are seeing in events where we can bring in emotions, we can bring in the fun, we can bring in metaverse. Now we can sit in Rajasthan, attend a wedding in Bermuda, wearing, uh, sitting here in the cold, but when my metaverse avatar is showing up in the Bermuda wedding, I am in my floral outfit, I am interacting with everyone there, I have an option of attending which event, which not event to attend, so this is the transition. So, yes, the future is bright, the future is uh, amazing for an industry which contributes to the GDP for $300 billion. $300 billion is the contribution of events and weddings in uh, the Indian GDP. So this is a huge market and uh, the irony, uh, Ravi, if I may, that we organize, uh, as an event planner, we organize uh, events, but the industry is unorganized. <laughs> so uh, I would like to open the floor, uh, I, if we could ask questions uh, about what are their thoughts, what, uh, if they want to uh, ask, you know, that what is the future that they feel like in events. So yeah, so I think uh, we are running out of time as well, so we'll mix each question in yes. the event also. Yeah. If we have any questions, so because I was really, I mean, there was great insight in terms of what is government doing, what uh, just Mudrika mentioned about the holographic image of the father, can't believe it. It's like somebody coming up, maybe you are in the Amitabh Bachchan in that event day, you know, enjoying that entire thing, you know, so lots of things are happening with digital technology and, and these lives are touched day in, day out. So quickly, if we can have just two questions, you know, because we are running out of time for the lunch. Any two questions, anybody want to ask? Yeah, please. Can we have the microphone or maybe you Considering the digital uh, working capital, which is your focus, uh, after open and fully digitized uh, lending flows, seconds, uh, quotes from 20 providers in seconds, further on, what do you see the evolution in the future, if you could look? Do you think uh, tokenized pieces of working capital of somebody and a basket of that being traded seamlessly, that might become the future, something in that direction? So, Nirita, I'll answer the question in terms of technology today. A technology makes everything a commodity, right? And until you make a product a commodity, you can't reach the mass market, which is like transforming lives and, and enable people to get transformed, right? So I, I really was just think what you know, what we call students about technology for events. The cost of doing an event is going down every day, only because of technology, right? So even at the OCAN level, at the working capital level, technology is making the entire lending a commodity. So everything will be a plug and play. The government has done the work, the we are not aware. I mean, I was talking to Anna right now. We can just plug and play. Anybody can just use their service center, but DSC, anybody is using, right? So technology can make it commodity and make it a mass market product. So do you think the technology is actually already here, kind of? So do you think working capital might be tokenized and sold to retail investors? In the future, I can't say that right now. But anyway, you I think, just you know, I think you will be the one to do it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. We'll do it someday. Yeah. The last question. Uh, my question is for uh, Anil sir. Uh, you very well told that Rajasthan is doing so many good projects for our citizens and all. So, uh, do you have any projects like uh, that for police verification other than Emitra? Like if we have to go to Emitra, then we have to fulfill some form, then only police verification is done. Is it possible to do it by our own mobile or our laptop? And another question is, uh, do you have something for the job portal for the un unemployed youth? They can, job portal. Job portal, we have, we have done job portal since 2012, I think. 
Great, sir. Great. And that recruitment portal, both for IPSC as well as for subordinate service board, uh, we are taking all applications online. Until now, I think we have taken almost three to four crore applications online. Oh, great, sir. I will see that. And sir, what about the specification of the tenants and servants about that? I need to check and I will Okay, check. thank you, sir. One, one question. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. One question. Last question, sir. Uh, actually, I want to ask you about the arcade. Okay, so we are running 10 centers in Jaipur. So, can arcade is providing distance education also? Yes, uh, not distance education. We are going to go in a hybrid mode uh, for these uh, the OEM courses very soon after two months. Yes, presently we are doing offline, but yes, we are going to go for uh, hybrid as well as the online mode. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think the next event should be done by uh, Mudrika where she should highlight what the government is doing. Such a lot of work is happening and we are not aware in terms of, I mean, I think we have been using these services from foreign companies, you know, MNCs, jabki wo apne jaipur ke antar yudhishya maat ka available hai, right? So it's like, just a source too. So I think maybe next time we'll do an event like that. Thank you so much and uh, I'd like, I'll call the participants and panelists for the video momentos. And during that time, there is a small video being played by the arcade. Can you do that, please? ये टेक्नोलॉजी का युग है इंफॉर्मेशन टेक्नोलॉजी का बढ़ता दायरा आज दुनिया को जहां नई रफ्तार दे रहा है वहीं युवाओं के लिए भी रोजगार के अनेक नए अवसर पैदा कर रहा है भारत के पूर्व प्रधानमंत्री श्री राजीव गांधी ने आईटी के महत्व और क्षमता को 1980 के दशक में ही समझ लिया था और देश को इक्कीसवीं सदी के लिए तैयार करना शुरू कर दिया था मुख्यमंत्री अशोक गहलोत ने इस सोच को और आगे बढ़ाते हुए राजस्थान को आईटी के क्षेत्र में एक अग्रणी राज्य बनाया है मुख्यमंत्री का मानना है कि अपार संभावनाओं से भरे इस फील्ड में युवाओं को जॉब रेडी बनाने के लिए कंसेप्चुअल लर्निंग के साथ ही कटिंग एज टेक्नोलॉजीज का भी एक्सपोजर मिले मुख्यमंत्री ने प्रदेश के विभिन्न शहरों में अत्याधुनिक लर्निंग सेंटर्स की घोषणा की है इसी कड़ी में जयपुर में राजीव गांधी सेंटर ऑफ एडवांस्ड टेक्नोलॉजी आर कैट की स्थापना की गई है आईटी के क्षेत्र में विभिन्न कोर्सेज कर रहे युवाओं के लिए ये एक बेहतरीन फिनिशिंग स्कूल है आर कैट में स्टूडेंट्स और आईटी प्रोफेशनल्स के लिए एडवांस और इमर्जिंग टेक्नोलॉजी से जुड़े ग्लोबली रिकोगनाइज सर्टिफिकेट कोर्सेज चलाए जाएंगे हर कोर्स का सर्टनेट ऑफ थिंग्स रोबोटिक्स और क्वांटम कंप्यूटिंग जैसे और भी कई इमर्जिंग टेक्नोलॉजी से जुड़े शॉर्ट टर्म कोर्सेज कराए जाएंगे आर कैट में ट्रेनिंग के लिए वर्ल्ड क्लास इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर और मॉडर्न इक्विपमेंट की व्यवस्था की गई है युवाओं को यहाँ ग्लोबल पार्टनर्स द्वारा नियुक्त मेंटोर से सीखने और लाइव प्रोजेक्ट्स पर काम करने का अवसर मिलेगा साथ ही युवाओं के लिए सॉफ्ट स्किल्स डेवेलपमेंट के मॉड्यूल भी संचालित किए जाएंगे आर कैट युवाओं को आईटी के क्षेत्र में रोजगार कुशल बनाने के लिए मुख्यमंत्री की अनूठी पहल है जो इनके लिए एक बेहतर करियर और सुनहरे भविष्य की राह आसान करेगी थैंक यू सो I just have taken the uh, my just collective uh, information. Arcade is center of the city. It is uh, on uh, exactly opposite SMS Hospital, which is the old Suchna Kendra. So you, uh, I, I had already uh, requested you all. You can please visit there, and uh, I would uh, ask uh, request you all again to uh, tell the students about the facility available and take advantage of that. And uh, government is sponsoring, giving you scholarships also. So the costly courses which are costing lakhs of rupees elsewhere, you can get scholarships as like free as well as at very uh, reasonable cost. So the students should take advantage of that, and we should uh, Rajasthan skilled youth ka number badna chahiye. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, everyone, for the being a fantastic audience, and thank you to all the speakers as well. May I now invite you on behalf of Fikhi for for the lunch. Please, the lunch is later on outside. We come back again in uh, one hour for the next session. Please, please be on time. Thank you so much. Thank you.
securing the digital frontiers. I would request the speakers to please come on dais, Mr. Singhal, Ms. Nita, Somesh. So, uh, the session chairman for this session is Mr. Somesh Gupta, who is Chief Growth Officer of Pinnacle Infotech. And I will do a brief introduction. Mr. Somesh Gupta has 25 years plus of experience in IT industry across diverse sectors, including large scale transformation, organization change management, delivery excellence, and customer management. He is also a subject matter expert in blockchain and cryptocurrency. Before joining Pinnacle as Chief Growth Officer, he was center head of Infosys Jabra Campus. In addition to overseeing the administrative and operational function, his role included leading organizational change management activities, creation of client-facing teams, and knowledge management systems. He has graduated from IIT BHU Varanasi with a Bachelor's of Technology degree in Electrical Engineering. Subsequently, he completed his Master's of Business Administration, Finance, and Strategy Economics from IIM Calcutta. So with this, uh, I give the charge of the session to Somishji. Over to you. Thank you, Atul. Thank you for those kind words. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, today, and to host uh, my co-panelists on this enigmatic topic, securing the digital frontiers. Now, there's a there's a question that I myself have. Does digital really have frontiers? Is it not possible to do anything and everything using digital? And um, just like when the space mission was launched, John F. Kennedy said, the sky is no more the limit. I don't think, or I postulate, that digital really doesn't have frontiers. There are milestones, there are stops, but not really frontiers. With that postulate, I'd like to uh, invite my co-panelist, Mr. Anurup Singhal, Director, Small and Medium Businesses, Microsoft India. He is currently Director of SMB in Microsoft India, has done his engineering from BIT Meshra and MBA from SPJ Institute of Management. He has 18 plus years of experience and worked with leading international firms. He was instrumental in setting up the GoDaddy Partner and Developer Channel in India. He presently leads the Microsoft India SMB business and drives initiatives to empower Indian businesses and drive all important cloud adoption. Andrew. Symbolize to you 
like as I said, without even unveiling what I have in my mind. Any efficiency or anything else? Better transition, right? Absolutely, right? So just get more done with this. What is the Indian connotation of doing more with this? I mean, there's a very fundamental connotation that we have all been raised with. Absolutely. I pretty much knew that this answer will come. So, this is actually a narrative, global narrative that Microsoft uh, worldwide is leading, especially for the uh, small and medium businesses. I'll have one more question to just wake us up all. Uh, how many of us in this room, the ones that are remaining, uh, run the technology business, are part of a technology business? Just a show of hands. One, two, three, uh, some in the panel. Thank you. Four, five, right? And if I were to tell you that today, uh, I think that the thematic of this conclave is that all businesses are fundamentally technology businesses. So, uh, so just really reflect back. There's actually nothing called that. Hey, I am a tech business, and you are not a tech business. Every business fundamentally is a tech business. And with that, uh, I'll bring up a very important quote uh, that Satya, uh, who's our CEO, said: uh, that digital technology is a deflationary force in an inflationary economy. Uh, businesses, small and large, can improve productivity and the affordability of their products and services by building tech intensity, right? So, it, it actually doesn't matter uh, which kind of business you operate, where you operate. Somebody from, uh, I was right now asking me outside that, what are the unique challenges of Rajasthan business? And I said the fundamental challenges are the same and, and some of them I just reflect. So, uh, you know, again, I'm going to talk about small and medium business, but I understand there are people from education, startups, multiple uh, industry. So, I think hopefully some of you will be able to connect with that. But uh, like the trend goes, I asked Chad GPT, uh, saying, hey, what are the problems? Everybody here has heard about Chad GPT? Anybody has heard about it? Right? I'm sure the, the millennials, millennials would have heard about it. Right? This is like the default thing on our houses, right? Because I said, what are the problems of SMBs? And if that gentleman from Time Zone India is actually in the room, these challenges are actually Chad GPT said, uh, which is access to finance lack of skilled labor, complex regulatory environment, and these are India uh, responses, right? Limited access to technology, infrastructure constraints, competition from larger firms, and limited access to market. So, again, coming back to the thematic of what we are, the digital Rajasthan uh, conclave from Fiki, basically, there are, even in this seven responses that chat GPT, which is, again, an AI bot at best, uh, trained only data from till 2021, uh, four out of the seven challenges can actually be met by technology. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're a small, medium, startup. Th these are pretty much extendable business situations that all of us are dealing with. And, and uh, I think prior to lunch, a lot of uh, people spoke about how technology can really solve that. So, I'll just come back to my thematic as to how technology uh, can set up our business to really be future ready. And what has specific impacts is really six ways to do more with less. Uh, and, and I'll just uncover one by one. So the number one challenge that businesses face, uh, and, and I think the lady from SAP also spoke about it briefly, is improving collaboration and productivity, right? Uh, I think somebody said get, the, get more done through yourself at the same time, or, or by employees. And uh, th this is a study that uh, Forrester did some time back. Uh, uh, in terms of just the challenges of employees, frontline workers, and people that you work with, right? I mean, today everything is pretty much hybrid. Uh, it's not extreme remote. It's not in office. It's hybrid. And uh, whether it's the, at the manager layer or the proprietor layer or the founder layer, people are we call it as the productivity param paranoid, right? The managers are thinking, hey, my employees are not working, and the employees are thinking, I'm overburned. So that's what we call it as the productivity paranoid. Somebody else, some folks are already smiling. So. They can create the problem, and that's why tools like technology, uh, Teams, Viva, actually come pretty handy, where you can pretty much engage uh, with them real time. You know, I was uh, catching up on my meeting on Teams right now. Uh, uh, you know, it's a beautiful platform to actually collaborate uh, instantaneously. So I have screenshots here where you can actually put out your work, co-author stuff. Uh, it's completely secure. You can have conversation. You can have channels. Any team users in the audience. Quite a lot of that. So great. Uh, it's a team is more than a meeting uh, uh, product, but it is really a booster to all our productivity and collaboration and uh, allows us to collaborate real time. 
The second example I take is automate manual business process. Again, irrespective of which business you look around, any vertical, there are fundamentally repeatable manual processes that actually, you know, I personally see my wife is a small business herself and I see everything done on WhatsApp. Right? Order that exchange on WhatsApp, everything on WhatsApp. And obviously that's not secure, that's not scalable. So how can we automate some fundamental core business processes uh, which are able to go uh, in a more efficient and scalable manner. Uh, today, again, technology allows us to have no code, low code applications. And I'm going to just give a demo live of an example of how you can use that to your advantage in whatever state of business you are, even if you are in a, uh, if, even if you are a student. So this is an example of <coughs> this is something we released this year. This is an example where you could literally draw on a paper an idea. And, and you could have an application created just by AI with zero code. That technology exists today. And I'll try and give a preview of that. But uh, the, the technology here from Microsoft is Power App. And, and, and as you can see, there's a paper I have right in front of me, which is uh, basically has a sketch. And we'll see how it uh, kind of just converts it into a Power application. So this is a real uh, recorded demo that I'm using at this point of time. Uh, we are not going to use any template because we are uploading an image taken on a phone, uh, right? So this is an image which I'll scroll to if the videos are coming clear. Uh, we name it as an appointment. We are trying to create an appointment app for a small business, and we upload an image. This is a this is already converted that hand sketch into a text. So it's classic example of uh, hand text to to, uh, to uh, text recognition. It's already playing around with toggles the buttons. And, and just uh, putting the frame in order. And this is zero touch. I mean, right now it's all happening through backend users to next, next, next. And another power app is already created. So it literally in less than a minute from a photo to an app, it's a booking appointment app. Uh, it's the simplest use case I've used, but you can use it for anything. Uh, it's already playing again, but I'll move that. So that's the second example. A uh, third, uh, I think we knew it all coming that content is queen or king. Right? And everything today in the internet world is how can you engage your customers on content, right? I mean, the, the number of posts my wife has a really small business, does an Instagram gram is, is uncanny because everything that you can do with now is content. So again, Canva has been the leader. Teams now has integrated Canva application. But what I'm going to show today is something that we released today. And, and I hope the video works. Security solutions today. What we have seen is that 
either small or large enterprises really bring in multiple providers of security, right? And they will have 50, 60 point players to solve for somebody solving the endpoint, somebody solving email, somebody solving the other gateway. But uh, again, from a Microsoft standpoint, uh, the, the thematic is do more with less. Uh, we, our solution bring almost 50 plus categories one shot together and, and you really don't need those uh, separate solutions. Uh, everything is powered by AI and automation, so it, uh, the technology automatically gives you trigger. Uh, even my mobile, if I have anything which comes up, the, the system alarm is just go ring and everything is through single uh, sign on somebody spoke about even pre-lunch. Uh, this is also one thing which I will share, to, if you are running a business, there are free uh, cyber security assessment, this is just one uh, ISP or an independent software vendor solution who created this, uh, you can try it out, it's, it's searchable on Google or Bing. Uh, in terms of folks who represent a small and medium business, again, the one-stop solution for multiple business process, right? again, we have seen really mid-sized organization having multiple ERP solutions or they will do an extreme low cost solution and then really struggling to scale. Uh, so the idea again is just bring all functions together, all processes together and the solution from our side is really something called business center. Uh, this is one example of a company in India who is successfully used and there are hundreds of examples that are using such solutions to really do more with this. Uh, this is a manufacturing example. Now I'll just end by saying I've spoken a lot about I have spoken about five ways that you can do more with less. Uh, one of the big challenges that we see in businesses, enterprises is, hey, I have so many options on how to compare. So I am going to throw this back uh, to the audience in terms of if you were to compare uh, software solutions today, where would you go? Anybody who's done that compare? Any portal? If you were to compare technology, where would you go? If you were to compare policy, life insurance policy, where would you go? Policy bazaar. Right? So, there are equivalent policy bazaars for tech, and that's what is my last section. Uh, so, these are, these are three companies, actually, two companies there which uh, came in, which is Tech Jockey and uh, G2, and there is Software Hub. These are all great platforms where you can actually compare, see reviews, and decide before you go in for a decision. Again, something for do more with this because the cost of making mistakes here is huge. You can see other users. Uh, these are not, of, unfortunately, very widely known platform. There are three, like I said, Tech, Jockey, G2, and Software Hub. Uh, all of them are in India. Uh, I'll just wrap up, uh, you know, in terms of just the mission that we are presenting, which is to really empower every organization and every person on the planet to achieve more. Uh, and the more is, again, the main thematic of my presentation, which is do more with less. So with that, I'll hand it to the next panel. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much, uh, Bless. And you talked briefly about cyber security. And our next speaker, Mr. Mukesh Chaudhary, uh, is going to speak more about that. Mr. Mukesh is founder and CEO of CyberOps. He is a CyberOps consultant and information security professional, having specialization in cyber crime investigation and intelligence acquisition. Mukesh has been assisting law enforcement agencies with his domain expertise for last 13 years. He has assisted intelligence agencies including military intelligence, IB, state intelligence of various states in cyber ops related to digital forensics, information gathering and handling of electronic evidence. He has been featured as an expert in two seasons of a documentary web series by the name Money Mafia on Discovery Plus. Episodes on these covered financial frauds related to phishing and site cryptocurrency happening in the country. He was awarded as an IT expert by the Education Minister of Rajasthan on the Independence Day 2014, awarded by Delhi Police in the year 2016 for solving a challenging case of multi-million dollar fraud within 24 hours, which was pending for more than six years. He was awarded by Chief Minister of Rajasthan on Independence Day 2017 for excellence in the field of cyber crime investigation and training programs. Uh, we are lucky to have Mr. Mukesh Amangas uh, and more importantly, he operates out of Jaipur. 
So Mr. Mukesh on insider threats and cyber security for organizations. Good afternoon, everyone. I said good afternoon. That's good. So, uh, insider threats, uh, I was just checking out uh, during the session. There was a report that uh, around 57 of the organization, they feel that 57% uh, of the organization, they feel that insider threats are growing. Now, with respect to cyber security, uh, India is still evolving and organizations are still uh, considering cyber security as extra added cost to the organization. Not paying serious threats and concerns to the, uh, sorry, serious concerns to the cyber security threats on their organizations and uh, upscaling or training their staff and giving them adequate knowledge on the cyber security is also required, which is not also properly handled and they are also not taking care of it. Since uh, the delegate is from Microsoft here, so I would like to highlight this. Uh, there is a culture going on from past many years. It is happening still in the organization as well as in the individuals also. We buy Microsoft uh, Windows, but we do not buy Microsoft Office. So which is again a practice and majority of uh, computer systems and uh, I will talk about uh, cross-border operations also in cyber warfare, like I have also done this in past many years. The hackers, when they want to compromise computer systems of any organization or individuals, one of the commonly used threat vector is compromising someone through Microsoft Office malicious document or Excel file. In past 10 years, this is one of the most common techniques used to compromise a computer system which I have experienced it. and it is still working and the major reason is not having a licensed Microsoft Office very basic and simple reason now there are many other reasons also so today we are talking about insider threats so I will give you two examples uh, because I have a limited session the duration is limited so one of the cases uh, is related to because in the past many years around from last uh, around 15, 2015, 16 onwards, world is seeing an uh, increasing cyber threat or uh, one of the global cyber security threat you can say is crypto ransomware attack because almost almost all the countries are infected through crypto ransomware attacks and countries are preparing themselves still how to uh, counter it and how to safeguard their systems. So on the darknet platforms there are many service providers available where they are marketing their products as crypto ransomware as a service, RAS based model. You must have been aware of SaaS, software as a service. Ransomware as a service, RAS, is the other term which they market themselves on darknet. Wherein like if let us suppose I am some employee, I am working in some organization and I want to earn easy money and in a shorter time period. What I need to do is, I need to go to darknet, I need to search for raspberry models and then I need to buy crypto ransomware malicious uh, um, this service from them. So I, either I am a coder or I am a programmer, I can develop my own crypto ransomware to infect someone and to uh, demand ransomware uh, ransom against that particular decryption or the solution of the data or else I can go to these platforms and I can be affiliate to them. And through this affiliation, either I can pay some amount to them and I can create my own separate portal or a separate solution or else I can take code from them and I can infect my own organization and whatever amount will be paid in return to decrypt the entire data, I will get a commission out of it. So this has become organized crime in the last 7-8 years. Now officially they are doing and this is happening on regular basis on regular time interval. Almost, almost all the, all the sectors are infected of crypto ransomware attacks. 
Another example is uh, there was a case wherein there was a company, the Ryzen based company, uh, they were into uh, making of luxurious brand, uh, luxurious products, lifestyle products. So uh, one of their clients from Russia approached them for a certain product category and the company submitted them the quotation. After receiving the quotation, the client called them back and said, hey, are you selling my leads or are you selling all the leads to someone? The company said, why will you sell the leads? He said, see, I have only approached you when I have received two different quotations from two different companies. One is yours and one is some other company. They asked for the company, which company it is. They further inquired and did some further investigation on it. And they got to know some one of the ex-employee of their company started his own company one year back when he left the company. And when they filed the case, we were investigating the case, we registered the case, investigated the case, and during the investigation, we found two major findings. One, this company never, con never ever conducted any cyber security audit. So they were not concerned about the cyber security. First. Secondly, this was the IT head, this guy was the IT head of the company. And when he left the company, he added his email ID into the forwarding section of the sales email ID. So whatever sales team used to receive emails, he used to receive a copy of the same. So then this company later on checked all their past one year leads and they got to know that why those leads were not converted because they got a better deal. So these kind of insider threats we need to identify. So uh, quick solution or quick uh, recommendations for in the insider threats is uh, sometimes the IT teams are uh, like in the audits also we have seen, we have observed that many of the IT team heads or CISOs or CTOs, they will defend themselves that there is no threat even though some researcher or cyber security researcher will submit them a security threat, they will deny there is no threat and then they will somehow patch the threat. Because if they will accept the threat, that means they are not able to secure the organizations properly. That way, they are basically a threat to the organization itself. So, there are a few uh, takeaways. So, one is third party audit is required for the organizations. Even though you have an insider team, you have an internal team of cyber security professionals, third party audit is required to have an independent and a transparent opinion, honest opinion from some other company as well. Another thing is if you are from non-tech background, if you are founder of company or CEO of a company and you are not from non-tech background, some IT guy who is heading the team and you are not that good at IT, then you have to take some other opinion from third party also. Because in case that guy is doing something wrong in the organization, organization can face severe losses in the near future. The rest, upscaling the team is also required because nowadays many cyber crimes are happening. Data breaches, incidents are very common in past many years. So, upscaling the entire team, whether they are from the tech background or they are from the non-tech background is also required. Recently, I was investigating a case of a company. Now, what happened was, the founder of the company, uh, the CEO of the company's WhatsApp account was created. A uh, picture was taken from Google and a fake account was created. The guy called to the landline of the company, asked for the accountant's contact number. The company uh, reception team or the reception guy gave the contact number, direct contact number of the accountant. Now this guy messaged the accountant wherein the CEO's picture was there on the contact asking to transfer some amount into certain bank accounts saying that I am in a meeting, I am busy for next few uh, hours so you transfer this much amount into these accounts and you won't believe 1 crore 10 lakh rupees were transferred into 9 different accounts now if this way it can be easily done so then many things can be done so first of all the team should be trained that what information to be shared to whom and how much you have to share. Also, who should have, uh, who should have how much access? That means basically the access control in organization to manage your internal cyber security. 
So that is all from my side. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Mukesh, for talking about the practical aspects of insider threats. Our next speaker uh, is Mr. Vineet Kumar. Uh, he is Deputy General Manager, Digital and Transactions Banking in the largest bank, State Bank of India. He's worked in various branches as branch head and headed HR department as chief manager. He's also worked in Forex Treasury as a dealer and also worked in back office operations. He worked as module head at Udaipur, Bikane, heading zones, and also worked in financial inclusion and micromanagement department. He is presently working as deputy general manager, digital and transaction banking unit. Mr. Vineet Kumar is going to speak about uh, next generation banking vis-a-vis -vis various banking frauds. Mr. Vineet. Distinguished guests, unbiased, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. I thank Vicky for organizing this country and I also thank for giving State Bank of India a chance to participate in this country. Sir, on the topic next generation banking and business banking frauds, Mr. Mukesh, my predecessor has just spoken many things on this. So, taking forward, since the manner customers access financial services is changing. Thanks to digital technology, during the COVID-19 induced lockdowns, digital mode of payments has seen a lot of traction. Customers benefit from digital payments because they make financial transactions easier. But this also opened the floodgates for digital banking frauds. Banking transactions have become technology driven. Significant rise in user digital platform in the recent years. But due to increased digital involvement, misuse of technology is also there. Enhanced risk of cyber frauds with far reaching implications of financial loss. Protesters use many ingenious technologies to defraud innocent customers of all ages and sections. Senior citizens who are not fully really acquainted with the techno financial ecosystem are targeted more. So, in the morning, one of my colleagues he was telling that as of day, how digital payment behave. In a month, on an average, 800 crore transactions, these are the numbers, these are being happening. And you can imagine the volume of amount involved in all in these transactions. But you see, the major contributor, UPI, 72% of the market share of the digital transactions have been taken by UPI. This is a convenient mode, but simultaneously, many more frauds are happening on this platform. I am dealing with the frauds also in my section and on an address in Rajasthan, in State Bank, I am getting 10 to 15 frauds on daily basis. A fraudsters duping innocent customers and siphoning the money. These are the common type of attacks phishing, wishing, smishing, sim swap, loan shark apps, social media community. Now I'll speak about phishing attacks because due to shorter of time I may not be in a position to play uh, a videos. See, this is the how phishing attack happens. Attackers send an email to the victim. Victim clicks on the email and goes to the phishing website. 
attackers collect the victim credentials from there and then attacker uses this victim credential to access the legitimate website and that is how frauds happen these are the common signs how phishing attacks are happening unreasonable threats then sense of urgency spelling mistakes or one can spell that these are common type of mis uh, uh, attacks which are how these are happening then there are grammatical mistakes suspicious urls unreasonable offers and once in a lifetime offers you see in 2020 85% of the organization had at least one employee attempt to connect to such a phishing website how we can prevent from this never use links provided in the mails which generally we used to do is better to type url separately instead of clicking on the uh, clicking on the link check for look alike email ids do not open attachments received through email from unknown persons flag and report suspicious emails conduct regular security awareness trainings be cautious when the requirement of urgency is shown be extra cautious when using your card details do not let them take by pop ups and spelling and bad grammars all these are things in case we take care then probably we can escape from the phishing attack what in the phishing attack again further if i classify there is spear phishing and mail in spear phishing what happens the attackers gathers intel on individual in a target company using the gather intel an email message is specially crafted as per target's interest the email contain malicious link or attachment then target receives the email in, in his is box and opens the mail with a malicious attachment and what happen this attachment the link leads to target to the malicious website or provides access to the victims system to the attackers as initial foothold for further major attacks how we can prevent this be skeptical be aware of your presence online be smart with your passwords inspect the link don't click the link implement anti phishing protections and conduct periodic awareness trainings a similar in billing attack it appears phishing attack against a high level executive just like in spear they target one person in the company but in billing eight attacks the executives like chief executive or chief financial officer in a diagram you can see attackers target an organization to the ceo or cfo email comes passes through the various filters then ceo receives the mail click on the link and fraudster gathers all the information all the valuable data which he wants again preventive measures multiple multi layer security system establish secure financial transfer rules then set up veiling prevention protocols implement data loss protection softwares educate your executives and advise and wishing there is a difference between phishing and wishing in wishing you get a voice call from the fraudsters to get the information to get the details personal details of the victim And then coming forward, the wishing attack. When you get the message, then you used to say it's the smishing, and the attackers creating such a situation that the other person, the victim, he trusts by posing a legitimate individual and organization, cyber criminals lower their targets, spectrum, SMS text. as a more personal communication channel also naturally lower a person's defense against their attacks 
Similarly, context and emotions. In emotions, by highlighting targets emotions, attackers can override their larger targets, critical thinking and spur them into rapid action. These are the real-time examples. Tax claiming suspicious activity on credit card, notification of mispackaged deliveries, notification that you have won an award or prize. And in the recent past, many of you might have received SMS that your electricity bill has not been paid, this will be disconnected, you kindly contact this number and many of us just simply dial the number and forward it. Then fake service from companies that you know and trust, password reset notification that you did not request, tax claiming that you owe a refund or overpayment. All these kind of messages, uh, in case we entertain, then probably we are going to fall victim. Then how to identify this face smishing SMS? The message will be irrelevant to you. Text message contains misspellings or poor grammar. It offers sender prices. The text message also contains suspicious things. Then another kind of fraud is the SIM swap. Under SIM swap, fraudsters manage to get a new SIM card used, issued against your registered mobile number through the mobile service provider. With the help of this new SIM card, they get one-time password, alerts required for making financial transactions through your bank accounts. How to protect? If your mobile number has stopped working for a longer than usual period, then please inquire with your mobile operator to make sure that you have not fallen victim to the scam. Register your MS, SMS and email alerts to stay informed about the activities in your bank account. And regularly check your bank statement and transaction history for the any difficulties. Then fake loan apps, these are, as of now in the market, there are too many and probably just for yesterday you might have gone through the paper and you have found that some uh, in Alward state, uh, few such fraudsters have been arrested. Through these fake loan apps, they allure the customer, customer, they customer share this photograph or other personal information and fraudsters use this information for illegal activities. See this kind of message you are getting, swishing, dear user, this is from the, I will say from SBI customers, SBI they are customers, they are getting such kind of funny messages, your SBI account will be blocked today, please update your pen card, thank you. USB click. See here, links are given totally fake. And moreover, the person who is sending the message is not proper. Any institution, they are sending the message, then probably their bank's name or institution's name will be there. You can see from here, these are not correct. Then social media. We will, to avoid online scams, never use Google search for these things. Banks websites, apps or softwares, customer care, coupon codes. See, while searching the Google, Google pay customer care number for the Rajasthan, the number which is shown by the Google and if you check through true callers, you can find out that this number belongs to someone, Kanchan Prajapati, this outside Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, means all these things and so we can desist ourselves from seeing everything from the Google that may raise problems also. So friends, join the fight against cybercrime, don't let it go unreported. To report unauthorized transactions or block your debit card or internet banking transaction for SBA customers, this is the number. What for complaints related to cyber frauds at National Crime Reporting Portal of Ministry of Home Affairs, https cybercrime.gov.in is the site 
uh, look at dial 1930 number also. 1930 you can remember at any time when you feel you fall victim of the fraud, you simply dial this number. Most likely chances are there, your money will be saved. You may get money after say 3 weeks or 4 weeks, but definitely you will get it. But you will have to be proactive in resisting your complaint or calling 1930. So in the, land, in the last, I will say go secure, go digital, let's summarize. Upgrade your device to latest operating system version regularly. If your device is lost or stolen, change your passwords. Do not share your PIN or password over text messages. Avoid public Wi-Fi by performing banking transactions. Use your cellular service provider's data for conducting banking transactions rather than public Wi-Fi. Check your account history to make sure no fraudulent transactions have taken place. Download bank, only, bank apps only, only from the Google Play Store or Apple Store. Don't use external links to download banking applications. Update your applications regularly. Do not use your real name or birth date to create a password. And it should be at least minimum 8 characters. Use a combination of uppercase, lowercase, letters, numbers, special characters. Enable an auto lock or timeout on your device or use a pin or locking mechanism on your phone. I feel in case we adopt all these things, then probably we can save, save ourselves for, from the, uh, falling from the, uh, this uh, fraudulent activities. So thank you very much. Have a good day. Stay safe. Stay aware and stay safe. Thank you. And wish you all a very happy Lodi and Makar Sakranti. Thank you. For reassuring us that the largest bank in India not only knows about cybersecurity but is taking due care of, of us and our money. Thank you so much. Our next speaker, uh, Ms. Nida, who is Director of Delivery in OGS, uh, OGS, OGS. She has worked as Information Security Professional for last 13 years uh, in, in, in the field of Information Security Management and Assurance with a background of Application Development. Some of the key areas in her professional journey include security services delivery, security governance, security audit, app security, infra security, etc. During her entire career, she has worked with private and public sector organizations, including public sector banks, telecom com companies, healthcare giants, etc. Today, she is going to talk about emerging cyber threats in consumer and in industrial IoT. Ms. Tinda. So, uh, when I am saying example, it can be smart watches, smart home, smart locks. There are industrial IoTs as well, but we will go later. So, these are basics in that we are reducing on a daily basis nowadays. But we are not aware about the threats related to the IoTs. So, when I am saying it's IoT, it stands for Internet of Things that describes the collection of devices or a network of devices that are embedded with the sensors, softwares, technologies for the purpose of exchanging the data and uh, over the internet. So, how it is possible? Anyone? Why are IoT is trending or emerging nowadays? No? So, we are moving toward artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, sensors, so uh, you must have heard about Alexa, Siri, these are some of the part of artificial intelligence. And we heard in the first session about cloud computing. So that is one of the uh, major areas that okay, are spreading across the uh, globe. So before we start and learn about the cyber threats in 
in IoT, there are some of the major famous well-known attacks that happened in previous uh, years. I'll start with 2016 uh, Mirai attack. Anyone heard about Mirai? Uh, Mirai is kind of a malware. If that gets injected, it will uh, uh, the DOS attack can happen on this system on the IoT device. So it, it is specifically on the IoT device. It is can the IoT devices creates the bot of the IoT devices and then create a botnet and impact the victim systems and network. So it happened, so Mirai happened in 2016 in one of the cyber expert firm and to safeguard themselves, those attackers uh, publish their code so that the different attackers can also attack uh, the victim IoT devices. This was one of the major attacks that happened in 2016. Moving towards 2017, there was one, uh, not attack, but US Food and Drug Administration declared and informed that the cardiac uh, systems on uh, of their use uh, uh, in US area, those were impacted and those were vulnerable to uh, to the uh, IoT uh, vulnerabilities. When I'm saying IoT vulnerabilities, it is the loophole or weakness that can impact in the US. Uh, I'm talking about 2017 attack. So in that, what they did, uh, the cardiac systems were vulnerable, and because of that, the shock waves can be modified or the uh, battery can be depleted if the attack gets exploited. If I go to 2018, uh, everyone heard about Las Vegas and casinos. Everyone want to book casinos. So there was one attack happened in 2018 where just by uh, getting the access of the aquarium that was there in the casino, they got, because it was uh, connected with the internet, they got the access and they were able to fetch the entire sensitive data. Then in 2019 and 20, uh, uh, Forever 21, everyone must have heard and they must have bought the comments as well. So uh, in 2019 and 20, uh, there was a, uh, I mean, China venture firm. Uh, those are, uh, I mean, uh, connected with the different different startups. They were attacked by uh, the cyber uh, attackers and the bad actors. And because of that, a million of credit and debit data got fetched by them. And that was one of the loss for Forever 21. That was one of the venture. In 2021 and 22, uh, so Philip was vulnerable to one of the attack that if it, that attack, uh, attack uh, got exploited, uh, the entire patient details uh, can be fetched and can be leaked. So it was rendered by them in quarter uh, 3, 2021. Uh, so, uh, I'll go next by the forecast of IoT industry. Uh, there are different uh, charts you can see over here. So, I'll start with the IoT active connections from 2015 till 2022. So, you can see a uh, spike from 2015 to 2022. So, connection in 2015 was only 0.86 million and in 2022 it is 4.76 million. So, people are started using the IoT. Whether it's a household or the industry, everyone is moving toward smart factories, smart home, smart car. So this is trending nowadays. Now IoT market, like I said, that is globally uh, spreading. So from 2015 to 2022, uh, I have mentioned about North America, Europe, Asia Pacific and Middle East. So you can see in 2015, it was only US, uh, negligible uh, Middle East, and Asia Pacific and in 2022 you, you can see that all the countries its uh, IoT is spreading. Now uh, it's spreading but there is a risk as well. So the, the main agenda of today's uh, topic is to safeguard uh, and to know about cyber threats in the IoT. So I have classified it into three portions. One is the user practice, another one is the exploit and third one is the malware. I'm going to give you the detail in the next slide. So like, like I said that there are cyber threats in IoT and these threats or risks can give impact uh, if it's a household or it's an industry, it can impact worsely in any of the case. So when I'm, so I'll start with the basic one expansion of attack surface. It means when I'm expanding, I mean the network is expanding, there are entry points that, that are connecting with the network. 
n points uh, those n points are called as the devices and when, if there is a spread in the devices so there are chances of risk of getting the bad actor connected with the network so this is one of the uh, major risk because we are not uh, verifying uh, when someone is connecting with our network then access to sensitive data obviously when uh, we are moving towards iot we are exchanging the data in the network from one device to the another device so uh, fetching data if it is not properly configured is a big risk because we are talking about sensitive data with, uh, so misconfiguration is one of the basic attack uh, that can happen it is because if the developer or the manufacturer are not putting the configuration properly in your system or in the network that can breach and exploit and can take over the entire system uh, everything is emerging iot systems uh, internet but we are lacking in the security portion of it so security in privacy is one of the major factor that should be looked upon when we are talking about any of the emerging areas uh, in this case uh, when i am talking about iot device authorization and fetching the sensitive data is the most critical and that is uh, getting impacted because we are still using the kcpl password default passwords and uh, to some extent we are using the hard coded password is it correct anyone using the default password or hard coded password for your any of the device let's say mobile or your door no one is using everyone is intelligent wow so ai and automation artificial intelligence and automation is the key portion in the iot devices and when we are talking about automation it's a risk as well because if everything is automated we are not going to look into the security feature and or we are not going to man manually look into that so um, i already explained about lack of security so because we are talking about cyber threats so there are different standards regulations are coming nowadays to safeguard these attack before coming over the internet or whenever we are deploying any system or whenever we are uh, using any uh, any particular device so uh, there are some standards that are uh, that are known for very long one is the owas uh, so owas what owas do they used to check the trend of the attacks every year and every year they, they publish the different kind of attacks that are uh, across globe so uh, they have published for iot specifically so owas is for mobile uh, application security web application security they are into the devsecops now they are moving towards iot as well so they have published uh, the top 10 for uh, iot like i mentioned about weak password or hard coded password is one then we have insecure network services when i am saying insecure network services we are connect, our devices are connected with the internet and if the services are vulnerable or if those services are not of use and we are put it on it can impact the entire infrastructure then we have insecure ecosystem interfaces when i am saying ecosystem our devices or um, the network are connected with any of the application or apis or mobile application so if application is vulnerable it can impact the entire ecosystem lack of secure update so whenever we are installing any of the software in our devices if it is not properly validated verified it can impact and the malware can be installed like we discussed on mirai if mirai was detected in advance that impact uh, would not happen so update should be verified it should be digitally signed or encrypted before uh, getting uh, installed in any of the system then use of insecure outdated component we are using uh, the technologies but in some of the cases we are using the outdated technologies as well uh, to fulfill the requirement but those outdated or legacy technologies can impact the entire system and our devices insufficient privacy protection like i am mentioning that iot used to exchange the data sensitive information we discussed about forever 21 attack the credit card and debit card information get fused so if we don't have the privacy protection related standards implemented in our system it can impact the entire uh, 
I mean, the sensor data can be fetched, the entire company or the manufacturer would be can go into the loss. Then we have to secure data transfer and storage. Again, the when the data is getting exchanged, it should be on a secure, uh, uh, a secure connection. Like we used to have HTTPS, SSL, all those things should be used whenever we are exchanging the data. So it uh, it can be data at rest or transmission, data at rest or data at transit. Lack of device management again. Uh, devices are connected, but it is not getting managed. It is not getting uh, monitored, and it is not getting hardened. Who is the weakest link in any of the system, whether it's nature or technology? Anyone? Who is the weakest link? It's human. We used to create. Uh, issues, we miss changing the password, we miss uh, locking our door. So, the, so, man is the weakest link. So, because we are discussing about the threats, we should know about protect, how to protect the threats as well. So, specifically for IoT, if we are connected with the different devices, it should be regularly monitored. It should be, uh, we should aware about how many devices are connected and those are authorized or not. Then we, if it is uh, in the different uh, network, it should the segmentation should be properly implemented. And I mentioned about the uh, password policy. So it should, the password policy should be as per the best practices that we have. Uh, when you said, uh, already informed us about uh, the password policies in the phishing and in uh, related to the bank attacks. Again, last but not the least, continue patching the firmwares. Like we discussed about the normal IoT that we are using it on a regular basis or we are started using it, we have the industrial IoT as well. So we had in our first session about the standard 4.0 that is towards the automation and artificial intelligence. So uh, cyber physical systems within partially structured smart factories play a central role in monitoring and supervising the natural process by taking the uh, autonomous and decentralized uh, decision in order to maximize the production. This is the definition of industrial uh, in, uh, standard 4.0. But how it impacts the industrial from the cyber threat perspective? All those devices are connected uh, with internet. There should be a controlling system who is supervising it and monitoring it. It is called as the industrial control system to monitor the entire industrial system uh, there is one of the famous uh, so before we i move to the industrial control system there is a diagram you can see perception here is the hardware that we are using it in the industry then we have the network here we are uh, we are passing our or passing the data then we have processing layer and application layer so you can see the data collection is from the perception layer to the application layer and vice versa control is from optimization so when attack is happening, it is happening from the from the application layer, and the data leakage or the if someone can fetch the data, it is from the perception layer. Obviously, that is the last layer. Now uh, we discuss about industrial IoT and in uh, standard 2.0, how it can be secured. So I mentioned about industrial control system in the previous slide. One of the industrial control system is SCADA. Uh, SCADA is one of the famous industrial control system. Uh, earlier we were not aware about SCADA, but there was one attack happened a uh, few years back uh, that impacted the nuclear power um, uh, manufacturing company of Iran. One fifth of the entire devices got impacted and the information uh, got revealed. Uh, it, it is called as Stuxnet. This is, attack name is Stuxnet. After that, people started taking the SCADA system seriously and putting uh, the controls on the SCADA system. The main feature of SCADA is supervised real-time data in the form of graphical presentation, control, industrial process locally or thoroughly, remotely, uh, on all on remote location, they, uh, it controls, then acquire the real-time data as well as the data logs. I am not going in detail about the different layers of the SCADA and what are the vulnerabilities. I will just jump into the 
some specific vulnerabilities and common when we hear about the name of these vulnerability, but that can impact the industrial IoT as well. Uh, so passive or active eavesdropping. Then we have man in the middle. So the, these two, I think uh, everyone must have heard about. Then we have masquerade. Uh, masquerade is a uh, very, very normal thing. I am not authorized person, but I am, let's say, you are being, sir, is the authorized person. I am taking this identity. And then I'm get, uh, I can get into the system. This is called as the masquerade. Then I talk about Mirai. So Mirai is the malware. So virus, stolen horse and bombs come under the malware. Then we discuss about the DOS attack. Fragmentation is kind of a DOS attack, but it manipulates the packet, the transmitted packets, and changes the size of the packet to get more impact on the system. Then we have a Cinderella. Cinderella, by the name itself, it goes. If someone uh, get the access on the network, it changes the internal clock of the network so that the software get impacted and they are not able to fetch the real-time information and they uh, maybe the server uh, get down or uh, server can take over the system as well. Then we have dot knock. So uh, UAP, if anyone heard about UAP user acceptance testing kind of a thing. Okay, so dot knock is kind of a UAP where authorized person is trying to check the different scenarios related to the software so that we can get the idea about the attack. For emerging trends, uh, as per the FOX review, we have, like we discussed about, uh, we should use the standards, different standards to privacy, protection, regulation. So we should, training is governance and regulation. Then IoT is moving towards healthcare as well. We discussed about one of the attack. IoT security should be there in, uh, in all the IoT devices. Then we are moving toward virtual uh, virtual systems. So digital twin and the enterprise metaverse should also be looked into. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nida, for that very educational session on cyber security related to IoT devices, both in the consumer space and industrial space. Uh, since we have such a knowledgeable panel here and you guys have been a great audience, uh, I would like to see if uh, any of you have questions or comments for any of the audience. Anybody has questions or comments? Yes, please. Hi. So uh, I am Shahzad from uh, EdTech Foundation, Agas. We are working on digital literacy. So we are running the campaign for digital awareness campaign. So we are including the cyber security and cyber awareness, digitally smart, so my question is ki how uh, Vinit Kumar sir, uh, your campaign is, uh, your slide are very good and so how can we use this data from your end for the community people? The organization data probably cannot share but for what State Bank can do, you can send an invitation to us so we can come to your uh, doorstep and uh, have the pre presentations. Anyone who can, who desires such pre presentations from State Bank, we will definitely come at your doorstep and do the things. Thank you. Not only that, we have experts like Mr. Mukesh, based out of Jaipur, who's, who's worked on such wide areas. We have one of the largest companies on the planet, Microsoft, and then huge experience in IoT. I'm sure all of them can pitch in. We have uh, I just came to know that you have written a book on blockchain. So, so can you tell us in detail uh, any of the proper use case that are being implemented in government or the private sectors as uh, most of the blockchain is 
mainly running behind uh, cryptos and uh, the dApps project related to that. So uh, if there are any uh, means uh, proper used cases related to uh, blockchain. Thank you. I was not expecting that question. Uh, the book is still in publishing stage, by the way, and it's called Fundamentals of Blockchain. But uh, since it is not very related, uh, suffice it to say that blockchain is a trust machine. Wherever you need trust, and that's why it has biggest use case is cyber money or digital money, right? Because that's where you need most trust. Wherever you need trust, wherever you need surety, right? Blockchain can be used across industries. We will talk of right now on this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, great. So this has been a great session. I'd now hand it over to Dimple. We'll now proceed for tea. Thank you. Session of the day. Everyone outside is requested to come in.